You know, I'll give you this, the RTS was never a great genre for consoles, but when you think about it, neither was the first person shooter, and that didn't stop Halo or Call of Duty from becoming gaming powerhouses on consoles. So I'm gonna make a bold claim today. Console RTSs, not that bad. Here's why. <laughs> The gaming world has become too conservative, if you think about it. And Jesus Christ, I'm not talking about politics. Relax. This is in regards to not wanting to take chances and sticking with what works forever. For the most part, we pretty much keep getting the same things over and over and over. You get your first-person shooters, the odd racing game here and there. That genre isn't as popular today as it was some 15 years ago. Every like 47 years, Rockstar makes a new GTA or whatever, this recent torrent of Battle Royale games, and then a few retro-styled indie titles sprinkled in between. Truth be told, at least we're done with awful movie tie-in games. I miss the time when big developers tried stuff that was kind of weird, or that wasn't really a perfect idea for a certain platform, but they still went, hey, heard you guys like this, there you go. And to me, nothing better encapsulates the fine put that on the PlayStation attitude than console real-time strategy games. So I decided to take a look back on some of the finest and since forgotten console RTSs. And what better game to start this video off with than Command & Conquer. I am a massive fan of the Command & Conquer series. Classic Westwood Command & Conquer was exactly the game that ignited my passion for the strategy genre. I remember like it was yesterday, I went to my cousin's house and he was playing Command & Conquer on his dad's computer. Now, I was no stranger to computer games or video games for that matter at the time, but something about Command & Conquer just seemed so different, because I was used to the idea of video games meaning you get a little guy and this is him, this is who you're playing, and he goes from this side of the screen to this side of the screen, and at the end you reach a flag or something that indicates that the level is done. It's like there's a geographical location in the map you have to get and you win. In Command and Conquer, like any other strategy game, you're not controlling one guy, you're controlling all of them. There isn't a person in the map that represents you. You're technically all of them because you can control all of them. So I remember looking at the screen and not even really understanding what I was looking at, but thinking that that looked really cool. He was playing the demo version of Command & Conquer that came in some CD-ROM magazine that I also had. So when I went home that night, I installed it on my dad's computer, and that became a love affair with RTSs that lasts to this day. And you know, Command & Conquer was the game that made me understand why people hate it when EA acquires a gaming studio. In 2003, EA bought Westwood Studios, and Command & Conquer has never been the same again. And there are a few games that are my personal favorites that have been ruined by EA, like Plants vs. Zombies, SimCity, friggin' Battlefront. More recently, I bought both Battlefronts. Can you... I'm an idiot. But Command & Conquer was my EA ruined my childhood story. That was the the, the first one that they got their, their, their greedy hands on and ruined for me. Now, though it also came out on the Sega Saturn, the PS1 version is the Command & Conquer port I am most familiar with. In case you never played Command & Conquer, first let me say, I'm really sorry. The game has been freeware for like 10 years now, so just go grab it. A little bit of a history lesson. So Command & Conquer is a real-time strategy game released by Westwood Studios for PC in August 31st, 1995. The game was based on the company's previous RTS, Dune 2000, and if you play both games, you can clearly see how some of the gameplay ideas they had for Dune 2000 really matured in Command & Conquer. So for the story, did you see Black Panther? I mean, it made like, 500 billion dollars, so chances are you did see it. Remember the rock with magic space stuff? The story in Command & Conquer is basically that, but in the universe of the game, uh, Vibranium is Tiberium, essentially. Anyway, Rock with the space stuff crashes on the planet, now there's Tiberium all over the place, and it's an interesting resource for a video game because it's both very valuable and very harmful to humans. So imagine if like gold gave you super space Ebola. It, it, it'd be a complicated world is what I'm saying. Anyway, there's this ancient secret society called Brotherhood of Nod. They figured out early on that Tiberium had economic potential and started hoarding this stuff ahead of everyone else. 
Before long, these homies got half of the world's supply of this stuff, and they figured, f*** it, we want the other half too. So they start al qaeda stuff in a mad bid to get it all. That's when the UN authorizes the Global Defense Initiative to go kick their asses. And that's our two factions. Nod is like a religious cult with guns and a vendetta against the world, whereas the GDI is a more traditional, straight-laced military force. Though both the Nod and the GDI have their distinct building types and units between the two of them, it wasn't until StarCraft that factions in RTS games became distinguishable enough that it forced the player to adopt a completely different playstyle depending on which side they picked. So to be totally honest, in retrospect, the main difference between the GDI and Nod were really cosmetic for the most part. Some different units, yeah, but it didn't alter the way you played that much. And to be quite frank, even though I am a fan, early RTS games weren't all that strategic when you think about it. Now, gameplay for Command & Conquer is the usual RTS fare, but in case you're unfamiliar, you usually start out with a base constructing vehicle, some money, and a few units. You have to gather resources, the uh, Tiberium we mentioned earlier, train units, expend your base, build new stuff, and kick ass. Now, for the most part, PS1 Command & Conquer looks about as good as it did on PC. CNC was known for cheesy full motion video segments, a tradition the series carried on with long after this stopped being a common practice for video games. I actually miss FMV. And these segments are proudly accounted for in the PS1 port. The same was true of the Sega Saturn port, but not of the infamous N64 version, which reworked the entire game into a 3D engine that, in my opinion, did not age as well. Looks wise, the main place where PS1 Command & Conquer differs from its PC counterpart is the building animations, if you can even call them that in this version. In PC Command & Conquer, buildings had this awesome deployment animation sequence. It made the game feel very futuristic, as if these buildings would come in a little container that just assembled itself once you place it on the battlefield. It's an awesome mental image that really captured my imagination as a kid. In PS1 Command & Conquer, on the other hand, no doubt due to the limitations of the hardware it ran on, buildings just kind of fade into existence. It's kind of lame. It is, in my opinion, the most disappointing thing about this port. It may seem like a really nitpicky thing, but I actually loved that building sequence, and I remember messing around with the game's speed on PC so I could see those sequences unfolding at different speeds to really appreciate all the detail in the animation. Now, about the controls. As you would expect, the RTS genre isn't perfectly suited to a video game controller, but Westwood Studios used an elegant solution that improves accuracy quite a bit. On the right hand side of your screen, you see the construction menu. Now on PC, you just move your mouse around and click on whatever you want to build. On a console, on the other hand, fine movements like carefully navigating a menu mid-gameplay would probably ruin your life every time. So to address that, they make the menu invisible until you hit triangle. That brings the menu up to the forefront, and then you can navigate the options by hitting up or down on the controller, a much more precise solution. When you're done, you hit triangle again and you're back into the game. You never really lose sight of the gameplay, it's always right there on your peripherals, so it's not as jarring as this may sound. Now, Command & Conquer on the PS1 isn't perfect, there isn't any game speed control like you would find on almost every other RTS, and this coupled with an inherently less precise control scheme makes the game actually more challenging than it should be, though some people might find that a positive. Everything just moves a bit too hectic for my liking, it's playable, but you're going to need to get good fast. Despite this issue, the game was generally well received at the time, and with a total of 28 missions, there is plenty to do in Command & Conquer. Red Alert! Red Alert was Command & Conquer's alternate history prequel released on the following year on PC and two years later again on the PlayStation. The story here is that Albert Einstein traveled back in time to kill Hitler, but this dummy made world history actually worse in the process because now we ended up with basically another Hitler in the form of an unopposed Stalin, so you still get World War II anyway. Thanks, Einstein. The famous Command & Conquer FMV segments appear again on the console, complete with that riveting intro sequence.
Now, no joke, this is the moment I realized I like metal. Red Alert's Hell March made such a tremendous impact on me as a kid, it's hard to overstate how much I loved it, and the game as a whole by association. When I see my younger relatives getting super jazzed up about Minecraft or Fortnite, drawing characters and inserting game references in regular conversation, it really reminds me of my own Red Alert obsession. In fact, one of the very first videos I ever uploaded to YouTube over my Brazilian channel is me filming the computer screen as the intro to Red Alert plays. Now again, this is some more than 10 years ago. It's not like today where you can just look these things up and see a video that has been properly exported to a video file then uploaded. A lot of the things that we wanted to see, it was just like, when it comes to gaming, it was people filming the screen. So don't, don't, it, it, it's a product of the time is what I'm trying to say. Gameplay in Red Alert is basically a carbon copy of the original game with a bunch of improvements. Thanks to that World War II-y flavor, it's really gonna come down to which setting you like best historical war or near future sci-fi. I'm gonna say Red Alert is a better game overall if for no other reason than the fact that you can tweak game speed to make it much better to play with a controller. Though game presentation is almost identical to that of its predecessor, there are a few notable differences. For instance, the construction menu I mentioned earlier, unlike with the original Command and Conquer, never fully disappears when you hit triangle, which can be a good or a bad thing. It blocks your view of the battlefield slightly but some would prefer to be able to keep up with unit and building construction progress at a glance. Red Alert was probably the console RTS I played the most. It was the one that convinced me that the genre could work really well with a controller. I missed many a bus stop because of this game and I'm gonna touch on that a little bit more later. Warcraft 2 it doesn't get much more classic than the Warcraft series, and it makes me so happy that the sport exists. Heads off the good people over at Blizzard and EA for making this happen. Well, what do you know? In case you've been living under a rock, Warcraft is the real-time strategy classic that is credited by many with kickstarting the RTS genre way back in 1994. As is usually the case with these things, Warcraft wasn't the first RTS, but it was one of the first to do it really, really well. Its sequel, Tides of Darkness, came out the following year to almost unanimous critical acclaim. It was also the main competitor to Command and & Conquer, and I had many a childhood argument over which series was the best. Personally, I'm a Command & Conquer guy, but, you know, just saying. My dad had this work buddy, we called him Uncle Mont, even though there was no relation, and he was a massive Warcraft 2 fan. And he's the one who actually introduced me to the series. All Uncle Monty would ever talk about was real-time strategy games, and I remember him telling me that he'd bring me a copy of Warcraft 2 next time he came over, and how insanely excited that made me. Now, I can't claim to be a massive Warcraft 2 fan in the same way that I am a fan of Command & Conquer. Like, I lived and breathed Command & Conquer as a kid, but Warcraft 2 was still very present in my childhood. The PS1 port is not only a very faithful adaptation of the PC original, but it also included content from the Beyond the Dark Portal expansion pack, making this a pretty complete package for Warcraft 2 aficionados to sink their teeth into. There were a lot of gameplay improvements as well, such as the ability to select up to 16 units at once, which is an upgrade from the PC where you could only select nine units at a time. It made moving your guys around a lot easier. They also did something really interesting with the actions menu. Hitting the square button once you selected a unit brings up this menu and it follows your guys around. From there, you can use your D-pad to select actions like attacking or building. To make gameplay more fluid on an inherently more limited control scheme, there are a lot of automation options in the game. You can set buildings to auto-recruit new units or auto-update attributes. It takes a lot of the back and forth from the game, allowing you to focus on the battle, which is the most important part. With over 50 missions to complete and customizable skirmish maps to mess around with if you're just in the mood for a quick match, there is a ton of content in Warcraft 2 for the PlayStation. The fact that I have EA to thank for for this port is perhaps the most conflicted I've ever felt about a gaming company. EA giveth, EA taketh away. Now, I mentioned earlier about missing bus stops because I was playing some of these games 
portably on the go. Now this is the beauty of RTS's on the PS1. That means that that library is accessible on the go on the PSP or on systems like the GPD XD Plus, which run PS1 games really, really well. That means you can play Command and Conquer, Red Alert, Syndicate Wars, Warcraft 2, and a lot of other RTS's that were ported for the PS1 wherever you go. And let me tell you, when I found out that so many of these RTS classics were available to me on the go dude oh my god when I say I missed bus stops and train stops because of these games that's not a turn of phrase it's not an exaggeration this happened on the regular honestly being able to play command and conquer on the go you guys know how much I love my portables was it, it it's no exaggeration to say it blew me away. So while some might be too eager to write off console RTSs as this failed experiment of the 90s, I am actually very, very thankful that these companies took the effort to bring those things to the PS1 because now I can play Warcraft 2 wherever. And dude, Warcraft 2, wherever. So I guess in the end, I have to say thank you, EA. Words I never thought I would say unironically. There are some more console RTSs that didn't make it to this list. Depending on how this video does, I might do a sequel with some more. As always, let me know what you think in the comments down below. Let me know where you're from. I'm always curious to find out where you guys are watching these videos from. Follow me on social media. I'm very active over there. I'm eager to talk to you guys. If you've been following me on Twitter or Instagram, you already knew a lot about this video from the behind the scenes stuff I've been posting there. So if you don't follow me yet, make sure to follow me. The links again are down below. And that's all the time I have for today. I'm Izzy and I'm done.